first song was Aqualung. The year was 1971. I'm Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull, and these are the sounds of the time. The 1970s have been called a decade of transition. And perhaps nowhere is that more evident than in music. After all, this is the generation that gave us punk, disco, and the heights of progressive rock. The sound was experimental, and the concepts tended toward the artistic. Few bands rode the wave of the moment more than Jethro Tull. It was the beginning of that, that era of improvised music slipping into the, the popular format. So it came via blues, it came via black American blues, and it had impacted upon a whole generation of young, middle-class, white British boys, most of whom went to art colleges. The sound, born in the late stages of the psychedelic 60s, would embody the experimental nature of the 70s. The same decade that would see the questioning of authority become the norm. From college campuses to the White House also saw musicians straying far from rock's roots in search of that new sound. We were enamored of this rather loose, slightly rebellious, um, and very free-flowing music that just seemed to erupt from the soul. The 70s also meant changing some of the most basic rules of rock. From the length of a song to the signature, even that rock staple of a guitar front and center. I was like many of my teenage peers back in the, in the mid 60s. You know, I wanted to be an electric guitar player. I mean, that, that was the sexy thing to do. Everybody wanted to play, you know, a Fender Strat or a Gibson Les Paul and, um, and be a, a guitar hero. Jethro Tull was the name of an 18th century British agriculturalist. He had no real meaning for Ian Anderson and his bandmates, yet it stuck. Whatever they called themselves, by the time the 60s gave way to the 70s, the band once called the New Cream had developed their own sound, and it started with a flute. The flute was, was a choice, not because it was particularly thought through, it was just hanging on the wall of a music store and I had my battered Fender Stratocaster and part exchanged it for a flute and a Shure Unidyne 3 microphone. And um, those two things, the flute and the microphone, served me over the next year or two in establishing Jethro Tull as a, you know, as a, a band with some emerging and growing popularity. Even if Anderson admits his finger placement on the flute was wrong until the 1990s, the instrument would take the lead on the band's biggest commercial success, the 1971 album Aqualung. The very beginning of, uh, of Aqualung, not that it's played on the flute, but this is the classic guitar line, and that began by me playing that on acoustic guitar. On acoustic guitar, in a, in a holiday in bedroom, trying not to wake up anybody in the room next door. But in my head, it was... So when I you know, then ran through that and showed the notes and the chords to Martin Barr, it became immediately something different. Jeff Rotold's sound would continue to evolve with the times, as the 70s came to a close and progressive rock lost its place on the radio. They would shift closer to the folk rock sound, finding that success in music tends to shift with the tastes and the times. Well, inspiration is, uh, it's, it is a mixture of inspiration, that sense of suddenly the time is right and you are visited by the muse. It's not something you choose to do, but you just have this creative moment, a creative flush. And that's, uh, that's nice when it happens, but I think more often than not, 
more than 50% of the time, you've actually got to go out and meet the muse halfway because if you don't step outside of yourself and your comfort zone and go looking for that inspiration, it's probably not going to come.